It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Bruce Bernd, the great scholar of Ramanujan. Today, he'll talk to us about balanced derivatives, identities, and bounds for trigonometric sums and Bessel series. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I apologize. I tried um, to log in for about 10 or 15 minutes and only just succeeded right now. So this is joint work with Martino Fasina, who is a postdoc at the University of Vienna. Uh, Sun Kim, who is on the faculty at Hunbuk University in Korea, and Alexander Zaharescu, my colleague at the University of Illinois. So let me show you some pictures of my co-authors. This is uh, Vasina. This is Sun Kim. And this is Alexander Zaharescu. Uh, picture is a little bit old. I'll have another picture of him later. I first like to express my thoughts for the millions of people who have been suffering from economic difficulties, serious illness, and, and death due to COVID-19. Probably most of you in the audience have had friends or family suffering from the COVID virus. This is one of the four photographs that we have of Ramanujan. It's the most famous one that was procured from Janaki Ramanujan's widow in 1936 by Chandra Sekar uh, for the purpose of putting this photo in Hardy's book, Ramanujan. If you'll recall that book, um, the passport stamps do not appear uh, in that picture. They were removed. Uh, Ramanujan had a strong interest in sums of squares. So I would like to begin with sums of squares and the famous circle problem. And then I will go to the divisor problem. And again, a contribution that Ramanujan made to solving the Dirichlet divisor problem. And then the methods that we use to examine these two formulas of Ramanujan for the circle and divisor problem, uh, we used uh, for finding identities for trigonometric sums and also estimates for trigonometric sums. So the last part uh, uh, is work, work in project pro process. And um, to do this work, we introduced the definition or the concept of a balanced derivative. So I would like to also talk about that. Okay, so this is one of the first entries from Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy. It's not exactly the problem on sums of squares that I will discuss, but it indicates Ramanujan's interest in sums of squares. So one, two, four, five, eight, nine, 10, 13, et cetera, are the either the self squares or can be expressed as a sum of two squares. And Ramanujan says the number of such numbers greater than A and less than B is equal to uh, this integral here. Uh, K is 0.764, theta of X is very small when compared with the previous integral. Note there is a slight error here, it's just a misprint. The theta of X, of course, should be theta of B. Well, this is really a remarkable result. So this is what Hardy had to say of it in his book uh, or in the collected papers of Ramanujan. The dominant term, that is KB log B to the minus one half in Ramanujan's notation, was first obtained by Landau in 1908. Ramanujan had none of Landau's weapons at his command. It is sufficiently marvelous that he should have even dreamt of problems such as these problems, which it has taken the finest mathematicians in Europe a hundred years to solve. So this is, really is a remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, he had none of the background to ever think about such problems and then to actually not only think of them, uh, to actually obtain uh, a result on the number of such uh, squares. So here is a picture of Hardy and Littlewood. It turns out that there is a page in Ramanujan's second notebook uh, in which he indicates this result, but you see here it's uh, very vague. Uh, in this 
representation for C, he does not fill in uh, what's in the parentheses. I've copied it uh, as closely as uh, I could from the second notebook. And then in the third notebook, he actually gives a proof of this. So it says three, page 350, the third notebook has only 33 pages, but in the Tata Institute's publication of the notebooks, the second and the third notebook are in the same volume. So this, the third notebook then continues on with the, the pagination of the second volume. So here he gives the exact value of K. Uh, so here note R runs through the primes of the form of 4M plus three. And uh, surprisingly, he sketches a proof of his claim in the third notebook. Uh, I might remark that of the 3,200 approximately claims in his three notebooks, there are only a handful in which he indicates any kind of a proof. And this is really the only proof uh, in the entire uh, three notebooks that's actually given by Ramanujan. So there's more space devoted to this than any other argument or proof in his notebooks. I don't think the third notebook was available to Hardy and Watson. Since Watson's handwritten personal copy of the notebooks, I don't think contains the third notebook. Well, that's not exactly the problem. That's not the problem I want to discuss. I want to discuss the famous circle problem. So R2 of n is the number of representations of n is a sum of two squares. So different signs and different orders of the sum n's yield distinct representations. So here we have five is plus or minus two squared plus, plus or minus one squared. Of course, we can invert the order of the sum n's and you see that R2 of five is therefore eight. Now each of these representations of N as the sum of two squares can be associated with a lattice point in the plane. For example, if you look at five equals minus two squared plus one squared, we can associate that with minus two one. And then each lattice point can be associated with a unit square. It doesn't make any difference which of the four squares we take, but we should be consistent so let's take the square such that the lattice point is in the southwest corner. So numerically, the number of representations as a sum of two squares, where n is less than or equal to x, is equal to the number of squares um, such that the southwest vertice of the square uh, is within a circle of radius square root x. So here uh, in this diagram, we have colored red, all of the squares associated with lattice points within the circle of radius square root x. Okay, so uh, if we look at the sum of R2 of n, the number of representations of n as the sum of two squares up to x, that will be approximately equal to the area of that circle, uh, pi times square root of x squared. And of course, there will be an error term. We put a prime on the summation to indicate that if x is an integer, uh, we only count a half r2 of x. The reason we do this is that in analytic studies of this sum, this is the sum which naturally arises. And then here, uh, if we count all the lattice points, we're counting the origin as well. So R2 of zero will be one there. So Gauss first examined this problem. He observed that if you take all these red squares, they're all within a circle of radius square root X plus square root two. And then if you take a circle of radius square root X minus square root two, that will be completely covered red. Okay, so taking these two inequalities together, uh, we see that R of X is pi X plus an error term, which is big O of square root of X. So the famous Gauss circle problem then asks for what is the optimal um, uh, upper bound that we can get for P of X as X tends to infinity. Well, this is definitely of interest to Ramanujan and Hardy. And in a paper that Hardy wrote in 1915, 
were published in 1915, which would have been shortly after Ramanujan arrived in England. Uh, Hardy says that the form of this equation, that is this identity, was suggested to me by Mr. S. Ramanujan. To my, I had communicated the analogous formula for d of one plus d of two up through d of n, where d of n is the number of divisors of n. So J1 is a Bessel function here, <coughs> excuse me. So I've always found this uh, statement by Hardy very strange because, you know, it's, he says the form of this equation. Well, if you ha have the form of the equation, you would really have the identity itself. In other words, you wouldn't say, well, Mr. Hardy, I think there's some representation for the error term involving Bessel functions. So you either would have that representation or not. So uh, I find Hardy's statement a little bit strange. Uh, so that series is a starting point often for upper bounds for the error term. As far as I know, this is the best result that we have. It's due to Huxley in 2003. Uh, Soundarajan has improved this a bit by replacing the X to the epsilon. Uh, by uh, quotient of logarithms. Yeah. <clears throat> so I forgot to mention one thing here that Hardy and Ramon Hardy showed in this paper that the error term is not big O of X to the one quarter. Yeah. He, he had a more precise result, but, uh, which I will actually uh, further discuss here in just a moment. So in that paper, uh, Hardy gives this identity, which he says is due to Ramanujan. And it's a really beautiful identity. It's not difficult to prove, but note you get from the left to the right-hand side by just interchanging the A and the B. Now, if we differentiate this with respect to B, let A tend to zero, replace two by square root B by S, and use analytic continuation, and we get this identity for the real part of S positive. And this is actually the key identity in Hardy's proof that the error term is omega plus or minus X to the one quarter. So I won't define the omega symbol here, probably most of you know it, but I just wanna emphasize that the error term then is not big O of X to the one quarter. Now, actually, Hardy had another proof of this identity as well. <clears throat> he actually gives them two proofs in his paper. And here is the exact reference of the paper. So the conjecture is that uh, Hardy's result uh, is actually close, the closest uh, to the actual order of the error term. In other words, most mathematicians feel that the error term is big O of X to the one quarter plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. Okay, I want to get to um, an identity of Ramanujan involving R2 of N. So first, let me recall an identity for R2 of N, which is often proved in, of course, in elementary number theory. So I'm going to use that identity uh, in the summatory function here. But I'm going to write this uh, sum uh, in this way. So you can easily see this is just an equivalent way of writing R2 of n. And then uh, we'll th write n as the product dj uh, for a divisor d of n. So we can think of this sum as the sum over all products dj less than or equal to x. So we'll sum on j first. And the sum on J first will be square brackets of X over D, or this is the greatest integer function. So we have this representation, an elementary representation for, for our summatory function. Now there's an identity involving R2 of N. It's found in a one page manuscript published with Ramanujan's lost notebook. That's just one page and it's page 335 uh, in the Tata Institute's publication of the lost notebook. Yeah. 
So here actually is the page uh, with the two formulas for the R2 of N problem and also for the divisor problem. Uh, I'll give these identities in more detail. So this is the first one. So J1 of X is the Bessel function just as we had before. So we have a, another parameter theta and these Bessel functions are the same kind of Bessel functions that we had in the hardy ramanujan formula with which uh, I mentioned a few moments ago. So this was first proved by uh, Sun Kim as our rescue and myself in this paper in 2013. Uh, here is a picture of Sun Kim at her uh, PhD uh, graduation about 10 years ago. Uh, she actually had two advisors. Kevin Ford uh, was also an advisor. Um, she has the ability of being able to do uh, research in various uh, areas of mathematics. She can switch over from one to another quite easily. Okay, so here is the identity. And here I'm saying that Zarescu and I first proved this in 2006. So you might ask, well, why did I say that the identity of Ramanujan was first proved by Sun Kim Zarescu and myself in 2013? Well, if you look at this closely, here we're summing uh, an first and then N. And Ramanujan's identity, we're summing on N first and then on M. So it turns out that uh, it was easier for Zaharescu and I to prove the identity with the order of summation reversed from what Ramanujan had. And to prove the identity uh, in the other direction for which Ramanujan stated the order of summation, uh, we couldn't use our ideas. So in other words, we had to use completely different ideas to prove the identity with the order of summation reversed. So let me just say a few words about this identity. If you let theta to be a quarter, then the left-hand side uh, reduces to this. And this is exactly the sum which I gave you a few minutes ago that can be derived in an elementary manner. And again, note that those Bessel functions are the same as in the hardy ramanujan formula. Of course, the arguments are different. So the big question is, can we use this extra parameter theta to attack the circle problem? So I have the feeling, but of course, I have no proof of my feeling that Ramanujan actually derived this formula to work on the circle problem. But I've never been able to use this formula in any way at all to attack the circle problem. So I'm afraid it's just a, a guess and I really don't know, but I think Ramanujan probably had the circle problem in mind uh, when he proved this formula. Okay, now let me go to the Dirichlet divisor problem and another entry uh, or statement from Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy. So he says, let us take the number of divisors of the natural numbers, one, two, two, three, two, four, et cetera. Uh, and he said the sum of such numbers up to N, this is the way he writes it, is equal to this main term plus one half the number of divisors of N. Uh, this is much too optimistic. Uh, that is this error term here. Uh, gamma is Euler's constant. Well, first of all, if D of N is the number of positive divisors of N, cap D of X is our summatory function with the prime having the same meaning as before. Namely, if X is an integer, we'll only count a half D of X. Okay, now we use the same kind of elementary argument uh, as I did a few moments ago. We can write D of X, of course, in this form as the sum of ones over all divisors of N. You write uh, N as the product dj and sum over all pairs dj, the product being less than or equal to x. 
you sum on J first, and then you get this uh, elementary formula for the summatory function D of X. Yeah. Okay, you can uh, look at this problem as a lattice point problem. So each divisor of N is uniquely associated with the lattice point DJ. So this would be in the first quadrant and it would be under a hyperbola, say AB equals X. So D of X is equal then to the number of lattice points in the first quadrant under on this hyperbola. So the Dirichlet divisor problem is equivalent. That is, we want to know what that error term is uh, for which Ramanujan had a very uh, uh, optimistic view. It's equivalent to the problem of estimating the number of lattice points under or on uh, a certain hyperbola. So Dirichlet and probably Ramanujan argued in this way to get that formula, which I just mentioned that Ramanujan sent to Hardy in his first letter. We take the region under the hyperbola AB equals X and divide it into three, three regions. So you first estimate the number of terms or lattice points in regions one and two, and then in regions one and three, which of course would be the same. And then since we counted the number of lattice points in this square, twice we subtract off uh, the number of lattice points in this square. So that's the main idea. So then uh, we get that the uh, D of X is equal to this. This is what Ramanujan had, but he said had N instead of X. I put this one quarter in just because in analytic uh, examinations of the Dirichlet divisor problem, this one quarter uh, just naturally arises. Of course, it can be put to, in the error term, delta of X. So now Dirichlet showed that the error term is big O of square root of X as X tends to infinity. Finding the correct order, the optimal order for the error term is called the Dirichlet divisor problem. And there is an analogous identity to the hardy ramanujan identity for R2 of N. So it involves other Bessel functions. So just Y is defined in terms of the ordinary Bessel function this way and, and K uh, in this way. And and so then one obtains, one can prove, as Voronoi did, uh, this representation uh, for the error term in terms of these Bessel functions y and k. So again, i1 would be uh, minus y1 of this argument that minus 2 over pi times the k Bessel function. And just uh, like we did for the uh, Gauss circle problem, uh, the asymptotic formulas for the Bessel functions are keys to estimating this sum on the right-hand side uh, in order to get bounds for the error term better than what Dirichlet got. So Voronoi proved uh, in 1904 that uh, delta of X is big O of X to the one third, log X is X tends to infinity. And again, the current uh, result, the best result, as far as I know, is due to Huxley. So if any listeners know of a better result, uh, uh, please let me know. As I mentioned, uh, Sondra Rajan uh, has replaced the X to the epsilon by uh, a quotient of logarithmic terms. Well, there's a, an identity involving D of N on this one page manuscript that I just showed you. And this is the uh, formula involving D of N. So instead of a sine, we have a cosine. Again, we have an extra parameter. And then we have these uh, I Bessel functions or these linear combinations of Y and K that we had before. Okay, so let me make a few comments. If we let theta to be zero, then the left-hand side just reduces to this. And this is that elementary formula the, that I proved about two minutes ago. 
Okay, again, I remind you that this is Voronoi's formula and the Bessel functions are the same ones as appear in Ramanujan's formula. So the first theorem we proved uh, is as follows. If we invert the order of summation and assume convergence for one value of theta, then we can prove the identity for all values of theta. So this was our first result. So again, this is due to Sun Kim's uh, rescue and myself uh, in another paper. But I emphasize we had the strange hypothesis. We had to assume convergence for one value of theta. And we had reversed the order of summation. Well, it seems like now I'm going off in another direction. You might, uh, but uh, I'll come back to this problem. So I want to go make a diversion for just a second here. So in Watson's retiring address as president of the London Mathematical Society, in 1936, he gave a lecture entitled, as i given it here, and uh, this is the published version of his lecture. So he calls this the final problem on account of the mock theta functions. And the reason he does this is that in Ramanujan's last letter to uh, Hardy, uh, the only letter that he re wrote to Hardy after he returned to India, he discusses mock theta functions. So and then in some sense, this, uh, the mock theta functions are what was thought of at that time, or probably is true, the last uh, creative uh, problem or problems that Ramanujan worked on. So Watson borrowed this title from uh, a famous uh, Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Final Problem. Now, uh, this is perhaps the most famous, and it's also the last of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And moreover, Sherlock Holmes' famous sidekick in the stories is Dr. Watson. So uh, a couple of reasons for why Watson chose uh, this as the title of his uh, last, of his valedictory address or uh, as uh, the title of his paper. Well, it took us a long time to actually um, solve the problem or prove the identity as Ramanujan had written it. So this is the final problem for Andrews and myself uh, when we edited the notebooks. So in our fifth and last volume uh, of the notebooks or our um, editing of Ramanujan's notebooks, we actually only proved the identity with the order of summation reversed. So this was our final problem. Um, but fortunately, we, we did solve it uh, just recently. Uh, so Junxian Li, a graduate student under Zarescu and myself, um, we finally proved this identity and we uh, published it in the Journal of the London Mathematical Society where Watson had published this paper. So if you want uh, uh, just a overview of the problem without any proofs, uh, this uh, expository uh, version of our paper was just published uh, within the past month actually in a volume uh, dedicated to George Andrews uh, on his 80th birthday. So here is a picture of uh, Junxian Li and uh, Zha Rescue. Uh, Junxian Li is currently a postdoc at the uh, Max Planck uh, Institute in Germany. Okay, let me just make a few comments uh, on our proof. So, the series on the right-hand side does not converge absolutely. And we have to use asymptotic formulas uh, for the Bessel functions in order to examine or prove this result. And here is probably the key idea. So in the identity, in the denominators are these uh, square roots. <laughs> and there's, um, so what, uh, 
we uh, do is to, in each case, for we introduce two complex variables. So there are actually uh, two complex variables. So instead of having n plus theta to the square root, we're going to replace the square root by s, and also we're going to replace the square root of n plus 1 minus theta, that power by w. So we're going to examine the series in these more in this these more general settings of complex variables s and w. And then later we'll use analytic continuation. So we can show that the series actually converges uniformly with respect to theta in any compact subinterval of zero one uh, under these conditions. So I just want to emphasize that uh, here we have a lower bound of 25, 26 if x is not an integer and five, six if x is not an integer. So if I just took square roots here, of course, on the left-hand side of this inequality, we would have a half and a half. So you see, we have bettered our uh, results, so to speak, or our convergence uh, by you know, augmenting the uh, domain of convergence here. So this is the key to get this improvement uh, on the uh, radicals that we have in the original formula. Okay, to do this, as it just indicates here, we have to separate the cases when x is an integer and x not an integer. And then we have to divide the intervals uh, in each uh, case into uh, intervals in with small and large values of m and n, as one often does in estimating trigonometric uh, sums. So this is the second major idea or involving series of ideas to determine what these intervals should be in order to show the uniform convergence. Yeah. Okay, then after we do that, we note that there are discontinuities on both sides of the identity that we want to prove. We can get rid of them by multiplying both sides by sine squared of pi theta. Then we just isolate the Bessel functions on the right-hand side. And then we calculate the Fourier series on both sides of the amended identity that we want to prove and show that the Fourier series are identical. Now on the left-hand side, it's not too difficult. It's quite easy to calculate the Fourier series. But on the right-hand side, where there's a double sum of Bessel functions, it's much more difficult to actually calculate the Fourier series. Uh, but one can do this. Indeed, the Fourier series are identical. And because uh, then both sides of our amended identity are continuous, we can appeal to the uniqueness theorem for Fourier series to conclude that the functions are identical and conclude the proof. So that's a sketch of uh, our proof of the last identity from the, I think I said Tata Institute is really the Neurosa uh, publication of the Lost Notebook and all the other fragments and unpublished papers that Ramanujan left us uh, at his uh, death. Yeah. Okay, now I'd like to uh, discuss some work on trigonometric sums that actually arose out of our ideas uh, improving these two formulas. So uh, some of the work I will now mention is in this paper we published in Crella in 2013. And the other parts will be in a paper uh, that we just submitted uh, for publication a few weeks ago. So here is one of the sums that we examine. So we have two variables now, sigma and theta. So sigma and theta uh, will be between zero and one. Okay, uh, we've made a conjecture about this sum. Namely, for every epsilon greater than zero as x tends to infinity, we conjecture that the, this sum is omega plus or minus x to the five quarters. Okay, so let me just give a very rough uh, idea as to how you might think of this. 
So for the circle problem, remember it's x to the one quarter. So note here that we have an m and an n in our sum. So we're of course then increasing, so to speak, the values of, of this sum. So if for each variable we increase by square root, then you would guess, well, then the error term should be about x to the five quarters, or this uh, should be an omega result. Well, that's a very rough reasoning. We have much more, much be better reasoning for this, but we can't prove it then. However, we can prove a, re uh, a result, a big O estimate. So this actually is a theorem that this sum is big O of x to the one four thirds plus epsilon, that for every epsilon greater than zero is x tends to infinity. Okay, so we have these trivial decimal expansions. So this result would be analogous to Voronoi's result for the sum of D of N. Remember that he showed the summatory functions B O of X to the one third uh, as X tends to infinity. So you know, roughly speaking, we've added a square root for each of those two variables then. So, and we would guess like we have for the circle problem, that probably this sum is uh, big O of x to the five fourths plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero as x tends to infinity. So just analogous to Hardy's result, uh, we think that this is probably the um, order of magnitude of the error term. So we've examined a few other sums of this type and uh, we have omega conjectures in each case. We don't have any theorems but we do have big O results for these. I thought I would just give you one special case of this. If you take theta and sigma to be a quarter, okay, then this is the sign that you have here for each, both of these, both the signs are equal to this. So this is just trivial. So you substitute these sign values in. So I've now indicated here what the arguments of theta and sigma r. So the only contributions are from odd indices. So I've replaced the m and n by 2j plus one and 2k plus one here. Okay, so uh, this is somewhat of a rather interesting lattice point problem. We are counting lattice points under a hyperbola, but we require both of the coordinates to be odd. And we put a weight uh, on these uh, lattice points, the weight being the lattice points themselves, and then the power of minus one. Uh, of course, for other values of theta and sigma, you can state similar kinds of results. We've also uh, examined uh, sums involving an arbitrary number of signs. So here we have k uh, signs, and here we've put our variables, uh, we put them as rational numbers uh, without really loss of generality here. Uh, so in other words, theta, for example, is replaced by A1 over P1. Uh, uh, A1 and P1 are relatively prime, et, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, we have a conjecture about these sums as well. And I've put uh, our conjectures now in, not in terms of the omega, uh, estimates, but in terms of lim soup and lim imp. Yeah. So we assume we conjecture that the lim soup of the sum divided by x to the 3k minus 1 over 2k is plus infinity and similarly for the lim imp. Yeah. So if k is equal to 2, then note that this reduces to 5 fourths what we had in the previous conjecture. Okay, so this is a theorem that we have, uh, our, our big O theorem. So we have this upper bound uh, for the sum as x tends to infinity. Okay, let's just look at uh, what's happening here as we increase the number of variables. So here I have k plus one variables, and the, the exponent for k plus one variables, here for k variables. Okay, so this is the difference by arithmetic. So you see that we, if we increase the value of k by one, we increase the upper bound that we have 
by a very small amount, big O of one over K squared. Now, I'm not saying that, of course, that these are the optimal upper bounds. I'm just indicating that this is what happened, what we have for the theorem that uh, we're, we're able to prove for upper bounds for the sine sums. Okay. So we would like to know if we can take partial derivatives. The reason we would like to take partial derivatives is that um, we want to show a uniform convergence. So then we don't have to worry about which order that we take our double sum like we had to worry about when we looked at Ramanujan's two problems on page, two identities on page 335 in the lost notebook. So we can take partial derivatives, invert the order of summation, if we take balanced partial derivatives. What we're indicating here is that we take the same number of derivatives in sigma and theta. So if we uh, do this, we say the identities that we obtain are balanced there. So if we don't take the same number of derivatives for sigma and theta, uh, we have an unbalanced number of derivatives. So uh, if we have an unbalanced number, we're not able to actually carry through our arguments uh, for convergence, for uniform convergence that we have in the balanced case. Okay, so to take an example, so here's another sum that we examine and have identities for. So if we take then the uh, partial with respect to sigma k times and theta k times, then we can actually move the partial derivatives uh, inside the summation. And uh, uh, we can do this by the uniform convergence. So here, there are actually four different quotients of Bessel functions appearing in our identity there. So uh, our, the key ideas uh, in, are somewhat the same as in our proof of Ramanujan's final identity. So here note that um, there are four Bessel functions appearing. And uh, when we take derivatives, we get and in each case, the number of Bessel functions uh, uh, is multiplied by two, etc. So again, what we do is to introduce two complex variables, S and uh, W. So before I just had, we just had one variable, theta, but now we have two variables, sigma and theta. Yeah. So the introduction of the complex variables is slightly different, uh, is, well, not slightly, but it is different from what we had before. Okay, uh, so, um, sorry, this is actually what I did before. I went backwards here. So uh, again, we assume that these inequalities are satisfied and we prove the same kinds of results for convergence that we had before. So I emphasize that although we have two complex variables, they are in a different, uh, different from what we had before. Before we just had one variable and we looked at n plus theta and n plus one minus theta. Here, we're looking at n plus theta and n plus sigma to these complex variables. Yeah. So we show that we have uniform convergence with respect to sigma and theta on any compact set in uh, zero one cross zero one. Yeah. So uh, here is, uh, an identity involving uh, two cosines, product of two cosines. This I Bessel function uh, is the same as we had before. That is the difference between the Y and the K Bessel functions. Uh, just might mention that in our proofs, we actually uh, encounter integrals of Bessel functions. So these are common uh, Bessel no, these are well-known formulas for j minus a half and j one half. And j three halves is actually a linear combination of these two. And this is a non-trivial evaluation, but uh, you can evaluate, we call, I call this t three halves because we have other kinds of t intervals there in terms of these Bessel functions. So, 
we can get an identity going back to our original sum involving uh, signs here. And for, in terms of this integral of Bessel functions or what I called T3 halves, or in terms of the Bessel functions, uh, the I Bessel functions. Yeah. Okay, and uh, just a couple minutes that I have, uh, I would like to uh, show you some photographs of um, buildings connected with Ramanujan. Uh, so this is the home where actually Ramanujan was born in Erod. And this is the home uh, in which, in Kombukonam where Ramanujan lived uh, for much of his life. So I was able to see this uh, home in 1984 when uh, Balu accompanied me uh, from Madras or Chennai uh, to uh, Kumbakonam. So I am very grateful for Balu to accompany me to Kumbakonam to see the house uh, that Ramanujan uh, was raised in. Uh, it's now been turned into a museum. Uh, I do, I've seen the museum, but I'm very pleased uh, that I was able to see the home as uh, Ramanujan actually lived in it. So behind, uh, there's a sort of a porch area behind the bamboo curtains. And the only uh, indication that this was Ramanujan's home came from a photograph of Ramanujan that was clipped from a newspaper and put above the entrance by the family living in the home. So here is uh, one picture of the inside of Ramanujan's home. And note there's some stairs here going up to a, a small second floor in the home. And here is another picture of uh, the father and uh, his children in the home. And uh, you will recognize Balo uh, talking with the father. Uh, here is a photograph of the high school that Ramanujan attended. You may not be able to recognize uh, this is Balu uh, talking with uh, two of the teachers uh, at the high school. Uh, here is a room in the high school named after Ramanujan. Uh, here's perhaps a better uh, view of the high school. So thank you, Balo, for taking me on this trip. I will never forget it. Uh, it was one of the highlights of my life. Happy birthday. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk and also sharing the lovely pictures of Kumbakonam and your visit there with Professor Balu. So let's thank the speaker. Questions or comments? Uh, probably, Professor Bruce, but you can probably mention the article in Mass Intelligence, I think, which you wrote immediately after your visit, which would yes. draw more details. Yes. Okay. I recommend it. Yes. Thank you very much for that recollection. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, the family in the last few pictures that you showed, are they uh, in some way the extended family of Ramanujan? Or? I don't no, know. They have no, uh, as far as I know, I think I asked that question. There really is yeah, no uh, family. Uh, they're, they're not related in any way to Ramanujan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, in that case, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah. So uh, we will resume at 8.30 for the next session. Thank you all for being present for this session and I hope you enjoyed it. Chauli, mm -hmm. you had any comments? Thank you, Kanidika, for chairing this session and thank, let us thank all the speakers of this session. And we will meet in one hour's time.